I'm looking at a headline from Fortune Magazine, no less. This is from yesterday. Being LGBT inclusive is good for business. <laughs> Justin Timberlake's Can't Stop the Feeling. We're talking this hour about who owns gay pride and some of the LGBTQ community saying that widespread, man, widespread mainstream embrace uh, acceptance now may in some ways threaten gay identity. Also concerned about the corporatization, about who's coming out and what that means for the culture and the politics going forward. If you've been out there, you've seen some big parades, all kinds of people turning out. Here's Scott Dodge doing his first ever Pride Parade in New York City this past weekend. Yeah, it's really mind-blowing. It's very epic and like fabulous and all those <laughs> words you want to use. Epic and fabulous and all kinds of people lining the streets. Here's Brooke Guinan. Transgender woman, the first openly transgender New York City firefighter. She talked to CNN about what she hoped to communicate while serving as Grand Marshal in the New York City Pride Parade on Sunday. Go out there and achieve your dreams and search for those things that make you happy and that you have the same rights as everyone else does. But there were protesters as well. LGBT protesters opposed police participation in the Pride Parade in New York City. This protester telling NBC what their mission was. days of the acquittal of Minnesota for the policeman who killed Philando Castile. Here are the protesters in Minneapolis. <laughs> the sound of some other LGBT parade goers urging the protesters to stop blocking the route. What was RuPaul's response? If they're going as a group of girls, it's something, you know, traditionally, and it's not always, but traditionally, they're going as a group of girls as a way, oh, let's go together, let's go together, so that they don't really have to go outside of their real house. Mm -hmm. they, they're tourists, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's not really saying, you're fierce and I'm going to respect you, for you queen, for who you are. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like you're they're there as a party clown. Just gay. People don't know how to place you in their consciousness. They think, yeah. oh, you must be here to make me look good. That's what gay guys are, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're an accessory for my straight life. Just because your limited view is that everyone's there to serve you and that you're the only person in the world, yeah. it doesn't work that way. Uh, we've got John Paul Bramer with us from NBC out this hour from New York. Sure. Um, I would just like to begin by saying I think it's a great thing that uh, attendance at Prides is up. I do think, however, with that comes a culture shift in how um, protests and how um, what we would call our radical roots are being perceived and changed. What is the soul of pride? What is it supposed to be? Is it a party? Is it a protest? Um, and I think that with increased uh, corporate interest in pride, we're seeing it start to skew towards the party end of things. Well, I think that this is the same sort of reckoning we're seeing in the progressive movement on the whole. So, for example, No Justice, No Pride was the group that disrupted the um, D.C. Capitol Pride Parade. They were protesting um, the corporate relationship with Pride, specifically uh, Wells Fargo, which had a hand in funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. So there were a lot of um, LGBT indigenous activists who were raising concerns over that. And that was met with a lot of hostility, and it was met with a lot of, well, why can't they just let us have our fun? I definitely think that that is a factor on a lot of people's minds right now. I mean, the LGBT community is, of course, extremely diverse. There are a lot of people within our community who would say this is a great thing. More straight people coming, more corporations lending their support to us. That's a sign of how far we've come. But when we encounter things like protests, like what No Justice No Pride is doing, disruption, that follows in the radical tradition of our community. So I, I think that, that the root of pride should be protest. I think it should be a here's our demands, here's what needs to change. And we have to make space for that as well as celebrating how far we've come. <clears throat> well, excuse me, I definitely don't think it's the victory. And I um, I think it's, a, it's often a great thing depending upon who the straight people are and why they're there. I mean, it, you know, there are a lot of different motivations and this, that's why I appreciate uh, Whitney who called in and talked about how the very same 
um, kids who were homophobically harassed her can now easily go to Target and buy a gay pride t-shirt and show up at a pride festival and, and not actually have to um, be pushed to think very much about their be how, how they had treated her or other queer kids or be held accountable to that. We also, at the same time that that's true, we cannot underestimate the infinitely um, co-optable gay party. But things have changed and now if we look at who's most vulnerable in the LGBT community, it's not actually about whether we can be out in public kissing, at least certainly not in major cities. Instead, it's, it's about the fact that trans people are queer people. Many of us now can dance in our underwear without getting arrested to have a public sexual space because, you know, where they could dance and be sexual together because, you know, we have a lot of issues that we could be coming together to work on. Well, I mean, isn't that the big question? And I, I think that that's really at the heart of what this debate is about. Is this about we are just like you or is this about we are different from you and we want to celebrate that? It's such a good question and I think it's both and I, I think they're related. I mean, there is, there is a divide in the queer community between um, sort of mainstream LGBT people who just want to assimilate and want um, being gay or, or trans to be a sort of inconsequential part of who they are. And then there's, um, you know, what we might call like a queer left or radical queers and, who, you know, who relate to, to queerness as a political stance, you know, who are um, invested in queerness precisely because it is anti-oppression because it is subversive, because it's about changing the way people um, think about and practice gender and sexuality. And so, so part of this is absolutely a reflection of tensions within queer spaces themselves. A self-identified lesbian, a woman herself. Jane Ward, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Tom. Um, so what's the, what's the debate about here? Yes, I think this is a tension that um, we can understand a little bit better if we go back to some of the historical context here. So corporate sponsorship of gay pride events really took off in the 1990s. And this happened in the broader context um, in, uh, of the mainstream gay and lesbian movement turning away in, in many ways from a more coalitional or intersectional social justice framework and, and toward repackaging gay people as ideal consumers, people who should be accepted by straight people because at the end of the day, they aren't asking for any kind of threatening social change, but they just want to be normal, they want to get married, they want to have kids, and they want to buy things. And this is very different from the original impulse of Pride marches, which, as John Paul said, were protest events in the early 1970s, and they emerged out of a pretty radical early gay liberation movement. And so I think this is how, slowly over time, what started out as... Um, queer protest that was about asking straight people to change the culture of gender and sexuality it's kind of devolved into a sort of drunken marketing expo basically that has all of the superficial appearance of being political even as it's existence is now dependent upon big business looking to sell their products to queer people. That, that neoliberalism sets up the conditions for um, corporations and for, you know, um, uh, powerful institutions like policing agencies to co-opt social movements to control. And I mean, it, you know, Whitney said she thought it was important for straight people to go to Pride so that they um, in, in some way have to hear uh, gay and lesbian people's stories. But most Pride events don't actually facilitate that at all. I mean, I just want to say what I think most of us who've been to Pride events know, which is that especially when straight people are going to the parade, it's a lot of alcohol, people gather for a party. 
um, they drink, they have fun watching the floats. It's not a particular, it's not a teaching, you know? So I think we need to be clear too about why are straight people going? And that's a perfect example of, of the way that rather than straight people fixing their own problems, there's instead a kind of exoticizing of gay people or a, a intruding on what queer people have created, which is a sex positive phenomenon that was queer eye for the straight guy. But this idea that LGBT people are kind of there to help straight people figure themselves out. And, you know, we saw, see this in like Sex in the City and on other programs where there's this idea that, like, you can have a a gaggle of your straight besties come to a gay bar and you know you'll be perfectly safe and everyone will just tell you how pretty you are. So are you disconcerted by the more open celebration of everybody is sort of included? I think that people understand the movement and I think people not only see the movement but especially young people. People who don't know. It used to be, oh my god, they're up there undressed and everything, and oh, it's obscene. We don't hear that so much anymore, because everybody's there. And that's one of the most, perhaps, complete kind of groupings, where people are there to enjoy, to protest, and to show themselves at the same time. We're joined by groups like uh, the Workers' Party, the Young Lords, Black Panthers. It did start as the Christopher Street Liberation Day Front. We also, at the same time that that's true, we cannot underestimate the infinitely um, co-optable gay party. <laughs> it, it's funny because, you know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, well, I have gay friends, so I definitely, you know, I'm not homophobic or I'm not transphobic. But I think that there are a lot of, there is that kind of internalized homophobia that, you know, I as a gay per person still somewhat deal with. But I think that there, that's definitely true that people kind of think of Pride as a big party. Which, and then at the, the same time though, like, isn't it kind of amazing that we can have a giant party to celebrate gay people? Like, that is a remarkable thing. I, um, when I, uh, I remember being a little kid and asking my mom what it meant to be gay. And she said that, you know, it would mean that my life would be much, much harder. And she kind of hoped I wasn't. And to have gotten to this point where you kind of have these frat bros who, on the one hand, are using homophobic slurs, but the other hand are like, yeah, we're all going to go to Pride. That's, it's so, it's very odd. But I think um, I wanted also to speak on um, one of the other, the person who's emailing in, talking about how, you know, these divides within this community have been here this whole time. Like, this isn't new. Um, these debates aren't new. And it's just something, you know, it's like, any other group of people of obviously we're of such disparate opinions and political views mm -hmm. and I think the fact that you know we have these differing perspectives and I think that that's that's kind of par for the course but at the same time you know I just keep thinking about the moments where um so I used to live in St. Louis and there's kind of a gay district in St. Louis called The Grove and I remember um I lived there in about 2009 and I remember meeting a kid there who was he was definitely underage welcome to the world LGBT Q listeners, is your identity being diluted, smothered by the big public embrace, or do you welcome the love? And of course, we know it's not universal by any means. Here's Jennifer Gulley, transgender woman, resident in St. Petersburg, Florida, explaining the significance of marching in the city's first ever transgender pride march last weekend, talking with Tampa Bay's 10 News. Sometimes, even though you feel discrimination within your own community, which is crazy to think, but it, you do feel a little of that. So it's nice that Black Lives Matter brought to us by Pepsi. We're coming out here and we have our own march. But part of the reason that some of us attend things like gay pride is to be with our friends who we now have who are gay. And a, um, uh, if you will, a regret or a, uh, a sadness that we were uh, anti-gay in our past. And now we're looking personally to make up for that, to help the gay community um, make progress. Yes, we do. And do we ask our employers to treat us fairly? Yes. 
and certainly a lot of LGBT people have worked um, from the inside to make change, to create more inclusive policies, to encourage their um, companies to take a stand on gay rights. And it was once a vibrant, booming queer um, subcultural hub is no longer that. Anyone who's done that work knows, <clears throat> excuse me, the fact that it works and it sells. And, you know, Tim Cook at Apple, you know, he's a gay man who's very interested in this. CEO, uh, Diane, thank you for calling. You're Hi. on. Hi there. Hi there. Uh, first of all, let me, let me clarify a major misconception. Corporate America did not decide to get on the bandwagon. I worked for at and started in the early 70s. These corporations are finally celebrating many people who've always been there, many in the shadows, and the, the, one, the one caller who talked about the sadness. We had a climate of non-inclusion, of separatism, of, of, of sadness, if you will. Mm -hmm. These were our co-workers, our union brothers and sisters, and the involvement of corporate America isn't coming from outside, it's coming from within the very corporations. How, how presumptive of us to, to assume that this very composition of people is not within corporate America. We have a new energy of acceptance for many of the incredibly talented people who have always been an integral part of making our, our corporation really innovative. But um, it's not the corporations all of a sudden saying, oh, here's a very wonderful vote movement for us to come on to. This was the composition of corporate America that is finally celebrating its own Incredible people. One more right here from Miami. Tom, you're on the air. Hi, uh, I'm actually 52. I'm old enough to have survived the gay holocaust in the 80s. In a place where I had no sanctuary in my family, in my school, yeah. in my workplace, to the point where friends of gay people would be beaten up. So you couldn't have straight friends, or they couldn't be socially accepted by the rest. So I am telling all of the young people who are here who think that we should re inflict or reimpose an activism, I will ask you this question. When a gay person who has come out of the closet, who is making a situation like that, comes to gay pride, that moment is the most sacred moment I can name in my life. And you could be damaging that. Is that what you get? Is, is your cause that worthwhile? So when more people come out, Tom, when more people come out, including straight people, do you welcome that or, or not? Absolutely. Listen, the whole point, y'all, the whole point of pride is love and forgiveness. 